sometimes it, it, getting into what is effectively my job now, uh, I spend more time pretending to be learned than actually yeah. learning. And I would, yeah. Early in the 17th century, Archbishop James Usher attempted to calculate the age of the earth down to the exact date of its creation, according to the Bible. His calculations were left unchallenged for centuries, and the so-called young earth creationists have accepted his determination of the age of the earth being roughly 6,000 years old, regardless of all the evidence to the contrary. However, they reject his date for the flood. The survey said... 100% wrong right out the gate. First, most young earth creationists do accept a very close version of Usher's chronology. You yourself even unwillingly admitted this in another video on your flood series. Usher dated the landing of Noah's Ark as the 5th of May in 1491 BCE. The survey said... <laughs> Again, 100% wrong. Usher's proposed date of the flood was specifically 2348 BC. Usher dated the landing of Noah's Ark as the 5th of May in 1491 BCE. The survey said... <laughs> this is when Usher said the exodus occurred, not the global flood. Ironically, Arn being so adamant that young earth creationists reject Usher's date of the flood when he doesn't even know when Usher said the flood happened is beyond ironic to me. But, alas, I should say that I never gave up on Arn, and I kept trying to find where he got this information from. I was never able to find any source backing up Arn Ross' claim for Usher dating the flood at 1491 BC, and I challenge any critic listening do the same. Just so you can see for yourself how fake of a guru this guy really is. Now, when plate tectonics happens, the ocean crust gets subducted, dragged under the continent crust down into the Earth's mantle. And sometimes we can use geophysical techniques to peek down into the mantle and see remnants of a subducted oceanic plate. It's actually rare to get a good look because they only last so many tens of millions of years. But if flood geology is honest, then the mantle should be full of spent oceanic slabs, all in exactly the same condition. This is standing for truth. Looking at continental drift, we are actually looking at continental sprint. We are looking at meters per second plate movements. Catastrophic plate tectonics actually predicts that the pre-flood ocean crust would be dragged down would be dragged down into the mantle in a process we all know of as subduction. This has happened according to the global flood model just a few thousand years ago. Therefore, we would predict that this cold ocean crust should still be cold today, even though it has actually just descended into the deep hot mantle. Modern seismologists have discovered that there are indeed huge cold slabs of rock down near the core itself in areas that should have warmed up if millions of years worth of time would actually brought those slabs down instead of the global flood of Noah. I have to convert the metrics since most of my target audience are Americans who don't understand science. So the vast majority of your audience, meaning your fans, are Americans who you're making fun of. Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> so to flood the world the way the Bible said, would take roughly three times the amount of water we already have. Where did all this extra water come from? And we know that it couldn't already be here because the land would still be covered now. It's these type of statements that make me think he has either never looked at a single flood model at all, or he is just straight out lying about what he says. Because nearly every flood model says that the oceans we're looking at today are a remnants of the flood waters that came out of the earth, including the icebergs, and that a good portion of the water receded back exactly like what's described in the Bible. Shut like, up! Studies of the human genome show that we've experienced a number of bottlenecks too, mostly associated with migration combined with a number of environmental factors. 
The most significant of these was more than 70,000 years ago when the entire human population was reduced to only a few thousand individuals. Imagine how much worse it would be if, there were, if it were ever down to just two individuals, one male and one female, such that all their descendants had to be incestuous. I think this is obvious because a direct expectation from the biblical model, okay, is in fact low genetic diversity in human beings. This is simply because God tells us in Genesis, okay, that he created two people, Adam and Eve. What would this do? Well, this would restrict levels of genetic diversity. Okay, this would restrict levels of genetic diversity also in the mitochondrial DNA, the Y chromosome, and this is exactly what we see, extremely low genetic variation, pointing us back to the first couple, Adam and Eve. Okay, modern genetic data has confirmed these expectations. And these claims made in Genesis are very, very specific. They did not have to be true. And yet, low genetic diversity is exactly what we see. We are 99.999% similar. Anybody on this planet. Now, the evolutionary community, I want to point out, they were completely shocked by this. Okay, because if the evolutionary fairy tale were true, for example, and man has actually evolved from ape-like ancestors okay the astralopithecines are evolving for millions of years and you've got you know the so-called transitional forms like habilis or sediba for example and then you've got erectus who's living on the planet for millions of years accumulating more and more genetic diversity you know mutations by definition add genetic diversity because a mutation is adding something that was not previously there okay so millions of years of human evolution, we would then expect higher levels of genetic diversity. And that's not what we've discovered. We've found low levels of genetic diversity. So what the evolutionary community had to do was invent a post hoc ad hoc out of Africa evolutionary bottleneck. It's rescue device upon rescue device upon rescue device with these evolutionists. And the reason why they invoked this was to reduce levels of heterozygosity and increase levels of homozygosity, okay? And what's funny is, according to the, the human evolution story, this would have been an extended, a prolonged population bottleneck. And this is necessary, according to their model, because they need to reduce those levels of genetic diversity to roughly where they are today to explain the data. We did not have to explain away the data. We didn't have to do that. And this is why it's post hoc ad hoc. They've essentially, what they've done is they've retrofitted the data, the genetic data into their story. But what's funny is the rescue device that they invoke, this, how, this hypothetical out of Africa population bottleneck, it would have been extremely genetically compromising to that population of say two to 10,000, because we know inbreeding by definition reveals the hidden reservoir of genetic mistakes. These mutations that have been accumulating for millions of years, they are in a recessive state. These are then manifested and what they do is they lead to rapid, they lead to accelerated genetic degeneration. Okay, these deleterious mutations, they're coming to the forefront. This population of two to 10,000 would have been so genetically compromised that there is no feasible way to then have this population suddenly explode into all parts of the world, seizing dominion over the planet. Without refrigeration or any means of preservation, it would not have been possible to store enough food just for the livestock, not for a whole year. And there wasn't much thought given to the wild animals either. How do you feed them? What did Noah feed the animals on the ark? Where did they all go to the bathroom? Obviously, this would be a huge problem, would it not? Well, not really. The answer to this is quite simple, especially when we look at cold regions of the world like Sweden, where seven months out of the year, it's so cold that the animals move under people's homes just to stay warm. To combat this, people are trying to keep them out, but it's nearly impossible. So people eventually just start spreading out a thin layer of wood shavings and peat moss with straw. It's called deep litter. It works by absorbing waste for up to two years, requiring no cleanup whatsoever and it also absorbs smell. One of the reasons why it works so good is by not removing the waste, good microbes come and make their homes in the litter, and these microbes actually eat and break down the feces and consume unhealthy bacteria, leaving good bacteria behind. As for the animals and eating, well, remember, these are small animals. 
they're very young, and they have to be because how else could they repopulate the earth if they're old? They might not even want to reproduce. So having very young, small animals on a ship would require not very much food. Also consider nearly all animals can fall into a hibernation state to survive extreme colds or famines. Also understand that modern man, Neanderthals, and Denisovans are all descended from an earlier species, Homo heidelbergensis, which also originated in Africa, itself a descendant of Homo erectus. Then they spread across Africa, and some of them made it out into the Middle East, where Neanderthals and Denisovans were born, so to speak. They're the only two human groups that apparently originated outside of Africa. Then they diverged and went their separate ways. And sometime after that, we emerged from Heidelbergensis tribes that were still in Africa. We share a common ancestor. Were Neanderthals human beings made in the image of God? Or are they evidence for human evolution? What does the evidence tell us? It turns out that Neanderthals are fully human. And this has been confirmed by modern scientific data. At that point, they would be magically created separate kinds and distinctly unique from those listed around it, as well as those apparently ancestral to it. So creationists have to show at least a handful of these barremans and show how we can distinguish them from their parent categories. This is the phylogeny challenge, the most damning argument there is against creationism, and no creationist can meet that challenge because they know this mystic boundary they allude to isn't really there. They made it up in an attempt to deny an abundantly evident reality. What is he talking about? Clearly he knows nothing about barmanology, nor has ever even studied it for a single day, because it directly answers what a created kind is. They even have their own names in barmanology called hollow barmans. If that's not bad enough for Aaron and evolution in general, it gets worse, because that mythical boundary he's making fun of for not existing, well guess what? Back in 2018, they discovered that there are genetic boundaries, and even the scientists themselves, after they discovered that all life was the same age, relented by stating that they fought against this data as hard as they could. One even went as far to say, Although it is easy to imagine that humans passed through a bottleneck 170,000 years ago, it's hard to believe that exactly the same thing happened in all species. Did herrings really pass through an equally recent bottleneck? Anchovies too? Do you notice a problem? They are so confused that all life, including aquatic life, all went through a global bottleneck. Of course, they think this happened around 200,000 years ago, but that's just their mindset. That's just their indoctrination. The fact that even in their own model, a global bottleneck happened at all, even in 200,000 years ago, is shocking to them. They didn't expect it, they didn't predict it, and the genetic evidence says it's right there. Aaron wouldn't know this because he doesn't keep up on the science whatsoever. And he obviously doesn't look at any conflicting evidence because he is the epitome of confirmation bias. Uh, who is the fraud? Who, who, is the, who is the fraudster? Many of the people watching this video won't care about anything I've said here. They'll object to and reject most of it because polls show that nearly half of Americans believe that the universe is younger than this sponge. And they believe in Noah's flood, even though none of that nonsense could withstand even a moment of critical examination or logical thought. The survey said... Historical genealogies, harmful genetic mutations, writing systems, mathematics, civilizations, all of these are documented at a rising 5,000 years ago. How? Why? It should be obvious. But yet, they want us to believe that humans waited 195,000 years to figure out all the same things at exactly the same time worldwide? Give me a break. They must think we are all so gullible if we're all just going to believe that nonsense. The oldest trees date right back to this time as well. Helium diffusion rates, right back to then. Mutation rates, right back to then. Magnetic decay rates, speciation rates, thermal illuminescence dating, 
coral growth rates, racemization rates, underground oil pressure, including the recently discovered cold subducted slabs under Earth's crust that can only be there if the global flood is true and it occurred recently. All of these just so happen to date right back to that same time period? That's far beyond coincidence. The probability of all these things lining up validates that the flood account is true and that it occurred recently. Everything about this fable is an impossible absurdity, yet somewhere between one-third and one-half of our adult population still believes that a 600-year-old man and three untrained laborers with no possible prior experience using only Stone Age tools with none of the equipment or transportation infrastructure necessary for a building that big somehow constructed a structurally impossibly large barge exceeding the skill level of modern shipwrights and even exceeding the limits of physics that could be applied to such a vessel which we can prove would have torn apart and sunk almost as soon as it got wet. Arendt starts off by mocking the biblical patriarch ages but again that's because he doesn't keep up with research at all. Well, geneticist Dr. John Sanford and Dr. Robert Carter thought they should test these genealogical ages and see what happens. They predicted that if the patriarchs were real people living to these extreme ages mentioned in the Bible, then the evidence would present itself. Lo and behold, after the ages were plotted, the results revealed what statisticians call an exponential power curve. Plotting their ages did not reveal a slow linear decline in ages as would be expected, but rather a curved one that reveals a typical biological decay curve exactly what we would expect to see if Noah's flood bottleneck was true and the former world had passed away, leaving humanity in a much worse state biologically. And three untrained laborers with no possible prior experience. Yes, you are correct. These were untrained laborers, but you don't need to be an expert to construct something when you're following directions. I don't need to be a construction worker when I get something from Ikea to put it together. And you got to remember, the instructions were given to Noah by God on how to build this thing. And you must think we are stupid and don't really actually realize that experiments have already been done to test whether the boat could withstand this. And that's right, they pass. Estimates are that there are roughly 5,000 species of mammals alive today, plus more than 10,000 species of reptiles, not including birds, of which there are another 10,000 species or so. Then there are another 7,600 amphibians, amounting to roughly 33,000 mostly terrestrial tetrapods altogether. That doesn't account for fish or insects with a vast majority of life on Earth, only the relative few that the biblical authors would recognize as having the breath of life. So the fable says that all the animals that had the breath of life would come to Noah to be saved from the flood. Thus, the first thought you might have is that Noah loaded 66,000 individual animals onto a box that couldn't possibly hold them all. In 2014, a group of master students at Lesta University decided to settle the question. They used the biblical measurements to calculate the size of the ark, then they used the density of the water to figure buoyancy, and from there, determine how much weight the ship could endure before sinking. Their conclusion? Noah could have put 70,000 animals on board and the ship would have floated. And what do you know? It floats! 